Hello again, you sick, twisted weather freaks, and welcome to another fun-filled, action-packed, and intellectually stimulating edition of This Week in Weather. I'm your host and evil scientist meteorologist DT from weatherist.com, your colonel of confusion, the captain of catastrophe, the commander of chaos. Let's talk about weather. we got a lot to talk about as November's gotten off to a really big start here. And uh, uh, October was definitely the transition month, and now we're in a totally different pattern. Daylight savings time has ended, and uh, we're back in the uh, cool pattern again, and it really reflected it, um, it, the change in the overall pattern. So first, we'll start out here taking a look at this picture of my smiling face. Of course, uh, there's the uh, Facebook page and the Twitter page. You want to reach me, that's how you can. Uh, I want to present this slide again from my last one. This is uh, some of the Climate Prediction Center forecasts from uh, when we've had pretty uh, over the last several years when we've had bad winters and uh, many times the climate prediction center forecast has missed the winter especially when it's been a bad one sometimes they've gotten it right sometimes they haven't um, i think they have a bias because of the global warming issue of uh, tendency of going neutral with weather for their uh, winter when they should be going a more colder um, but that's just my opinion um this is a, this is a, their uh, winter forecast here for December, January, February. You can see the weather conditions across the upper Midwest, the Dakotas, into New England. And then uh, they have slightly mild conditions on the East Coast. I disagree with this strongly. I think this is a very bad forecast. Uh, but they do have it actually a little better on the second half of winter, January, February, March, a little bit uh, closer to normal temperatures in the Midwest and the Northeast. But again, I think this is way too conservative forecast and doesn't match my winter forecast at all. Uh, this here is the uh, climate. This is the drought uh, update here from October 29th. And of course, keep in mind, we had a big rainstorm here on the 30th and 31st. So a lot of this yellow stuff in the middle Atlantic states, that's all gone now. And you can see how impressive the rain has been here for the month of October. Uh, this is the uh, precipitation for the last 30 days, the actual precipitation on the left and the departure from normal. And you can see, you know, the green color represents five inches of actual precipitation. I'm looking on the left hand side here. Um, so uh, I think that's pretty significant. Uh, you know, the five inches of green color here, five to six point five inches. The dark green is six point five to eight inches over the last thirty days. So there's been pretty significant rain here. Now, east of North Carolina is not nearly that much. They're around three point five, uh, two to five inch rains here. But for the lot of the mid, mid, uh, mid Atlantic, it's been pretty good rains. And departure from normal, uh, you can see that uh, you know the purple stuff is four and a half to six inches above normal rainfall. The dark green over most of eastern Virginia was one and a half to three inches above normal. Uh, and even central North Carolina is done pretty good. Uh, West Virginia has had three to, three to four and a half inches above normal. The mountains in western North Carolina, a lot of ski resorts down there, they're really hurting for the lack of moisture. They've gotten tremendous moisture up to six inches above normal in the past 30 days. If we break this down by percentages of normal, we can see that, in fact, uh, a lot of the uh, West Virginia, Kentucky, Tennessee, west of North Carolina, Virginia, Maryland, Delaware, Pennsylvania has seen anywhere from 150 to 300 percent above normal rainfall for the month of October. Pretty darn significant. Uh, this is now if we just if we just enlarge this. This is Virginia, West Virginia, Maryland, Delaware. And you can see here that the precipitation over the last 30 days has been, if you look at the inches, uh, a pretty darn significant rain. This this purple stuff in here, this is five and a half to six and a half inch inch rains, all of this in here. Look at this. Really good rains over the last uh, 30 days. Uh, quite significant. And then if we break it down to the anomalies, again, uh, the upper right here is departure from normal precipitation. A lot of areas you can see two and a half to four inches above normal rainfall in here. Um, in this area, in this area in here, this is all two and a half to four inches and all of this stuff. Only uh, right around uh, northeast uh, West Virginia, Western Maryland have been closer to uh, only a little above normal. And then the percentages above normal again, look at all the purple stuff here, to 150 to 300% above normal for the entire area, except for little areas in far northeast West Virginia and portions of northwest, the northern Shenandoah Valley into Hagerstown, or maybe, um, I guess that would be Oh, what's the name of that? Hancock in uh, in Western Maryland. So uh, very significant. If you look at North Carolina, not quite as wet, but not bad. The western half of the state uh, over the last 30 days, as you can see, uh, uh, in terms of actual precipitation. So the green color is five to six and a half inch rains 
over the last 30 days. Very nice in here. There's yellow stuff, still three and a half to five inch range. That's not bad. But again, the eastern area has been pretty dry. And if you look at the percentages of normal, way above normal, 200, 300% above normal. And then the green and the blues are 150 to 300% above normal there. So again, it's been a good October. In terms of the snowfall, we finished up. Look at the black line, very close to the above normal area. Um, so that's the, the snow cover in Eurasia is deep. It advanced very quickly and extends way far to the west. So it's also a large snow cover extent as well. And we can see that by taking a look at the hemispheric shot. This is as of November 1st, November 2nd. We can see that the snow cover has really advanced. And this is the important point here. Sometimes it goes down into, you know, into Mongolia, but it's all goes to here. But look at all the snow cover. It's gone all the way into Poland, for Pete's sake. Very significant snow cover early. This is the snow cover in Canada, very deep as well, quite early on. Well, quite significant, I must say. Temperatures over the last seven days and 14 days. You can see where the, uh, cool, where the temperatures have been... Um, uh, you know, generally mild on the East Coast and just now cooling down. But you can see with that snow cover and the amount of cold air in Canada, it's been pushing southward in the pattern uh, into into the West Coast. But the Rockies and the Plains and the upper Midwest, way, way, way below normal. Uh, you can see the, the these anomalies here. They're, uh, that purple stuff is 50, 20 degrees below normal over the last uh, two weeks. Uh, over the last week here on the left and last two weeks, uh, the, again, the purple stuff, 15 degrees below normal. The, the blue uh, is 10 to 15 degrees below normal. Very impressive. All right, slide 15, my next slide here. Now, this is talking about the overall pattern. And this is as of Sunday evening. So we can just point out a few things here. There's our big ridge on the West Coast, bringing the cold air in out of Canada, just like this. Okay, look at an enormous trough here. It's broad and it's deep. Now, you don't have, but we, this is a, a North Atlantic ridge. It's not really in Greenland yet. It's just the North Atlantic Ridge, and there's our polar vortex. It's a cold pattern, very cold for November. If this was December or January, February, it would be impressively cold, but you know, not extremely. But this is a pretty good pattern here. Um, now this is the next five days, and what happens? So both models are showing almost identical patterns. GFS, the European, you can see the ridge is very strong on the West Coast. Big broad trough over the entire. Um, uh, east, central and eastern portion of the country. Right in here, you can see that. Look at the size of this thing. Now, it's not very deep. You notice it's kind of round. You see that? So we refer to that as a U-shaped trough here, a U-shaped trough. And that's what we're looking at. It's not one of these sharp ones like that where you get a big storm at the base of it. So it's a broad-shaped trough. And both models have it. Well, you are seeing some ridging in Canada here, so that's a good sign. So it's a deep, cold trough. Uh, a lot of cold air coming to Canada, but it's not, like I said, it's not very sharp. It's not, doesn't have a big point to it. Now, the other thing to notice is that both models have this little piece of energy right here over Baja. You see this thing? A little piece of energy shortwave right there. And that's important because that's going to cause some problems with the weather models down, down the road here over the next few days. Temperatures over the next five days, cold. If you look in Virginia, Maryland, uh, West Virginia, eh, close to normal, maybe a half a degree or so below normal. But then when you get to the upper Midwest, a lot of cold air, uh, cold air putting snow down on the ground, expanding the cold base. And that's what you want to see early in the winter season. Uh, slide, my next slide here. Now, this is the models here. And what happens is there's just a bunch of cold fronts that move through. So the one in the upper left, this is Monday, Monday afternoon. We can see the first high is here, right? You see that. And then here's the next high over here. And we have another cold front coming down. See that? And now this is a Wednesday night into Thursday, another high here, another cold front coming here. It's just boom, boom, boom. Because of this pattern, the cold front is coming fast and furious. And then finally, uh, on uh, Friday, we have a strong cold front that pushes through again. And this cold front now stalls and we see low pressure develops here. And this is now on Thursday night into Friday, the low moves over Alabama. Now notice we have a big high here, right here, cold Arctic high. Now, if this precipitation were to come north, it would come in as, as frozen precipitation in the uh, Ohio Valley, Mid-Atlantic, that sort of thing. On the GFS, it keeps the low fairly far to the south, and we have rain getting into Virginia, which goes over to snow, according to the GFS. This is the 12Z Sunday GFS, and we can see that here in just a minute. If we look at it and enlarge it a little bit there, it goes low, goes off the coast. This is Friday night. The high's over Wisconsin. You have a strong north wind bringing in very cold air for this time of year. And look, you got snow over 
Richmond and potentially the Northern Neck and Danville and maybe Greensboro and that sort of stuff. There's the low off the coast. Look where the low stays way south. And this is a this is a possibility if the GFS solution is correct. Now, the problem is that the European is a vastly different solution. This is what the Europeans were showing last couple of days. Oh, let me skip the slide and go back to this. Uh, you can see the European has a low and this area right here, one and another one here. Um, and as a result, the rain snow line is way far to the north, up across Pennsylvania, north of New York City. So uh, this would make more sense climatology, a snow in the mountains of New York, of New England and Vermont, and western Massachusetts, central and northern Pennsylvania, maybe Ohio. This makes sense climatology wise. So which solution is correct? Well, that's the that's the question, isn't it? And one of the things we can take a look at is here, we compare the two models. Now, the upper left is the GFS valid for um, a Thursday early morning. And the next one here is Wednesday night. The bottom right is the European. The point here is that both of these models have this little piece of energy in the southern jet stream. There it is on the GFS, much stronger. And there it is on the European. So what happens is uh, this piece of energy comes eastward. And what it does is is that determines then the, we have the northern branch here. So this here's our ridge. You can see the lines coming plunging southward. This piece of energy wants to drop and they phase. So the question is, where do they phase? Now, the European, notice the phase is like this. You see the lines are going here. So this piece of energy comes in and it gets pulled northward. It phases up in here. The GFS phases the stream. See how much sharper it is? How it's plunging southward? Big difference between this and this. And that's why you end up getting different snowstorm possibilities. So, and you can see what happens. Uh, I had 120 hours, 123 hours, Friday night, Saturday morning. The uh, GFS has a partial phase right here between the two streams. And notice this big, huge, giant low here. That forces this system to stay way to the south. Notice this big, you can see the dark green here, upper low. That's not here. That's over here. It's further away. So as a result, you have the trough here, and the low is now much further north. This, this is the big piece that makes a difference, whether it's here or here. And, of course, the odds favor right now, since there's not enough blocking in Greenland to support that, that's going to be up here. So that's why the European solution is more likely to be correct. I'd like to see snow in Virginia in November. I just don't think it's going to happen. Okay. Now, a couple of days ago, the GFS went ballistic, showing a goofy solution here, which is another reason why you want to be skeptical about the GFS snow solution at the end of the week in Virginia. Uh, this was the GFS for a couple of days ago, and you can see it developed this huge upper low, a monster low. This is the actual jet stream pattern here. You can see it right here. Oops, let me call it up again. There you go. There it is, and you can notice the big closed contour right here like this, and another one like this. Now, this is, what, this is the anomaly. Okay, remember, this is the anomaly right here. And compare that to where it should be. So you can see the models off the charts with this thing. The GFS has this huge piece of energy from the polar vortex, brings it down to the Great Lakes, goes bongo with it, develops a monster trough, severe Arctic outbreak early in the season. This is bullshit. Complete and total crap. You should ignore it completely. Not going to happen. And the proof of that is the GFS ensembles from the same day. This was from... Um, this is from early on the on on the uh, last night, actually early Sunday morning, and you can see it does not have a huge monster up below here. Um, it has instead, uh, you know, it does not see that. It's got a nice broad trough, and it's cold. And it's impressive for November, but it's not a huge upper level storm, which is what the model is showing here. So you can see that. So that's what that's why I want to point it out to you. Okay, that was one of the flaws of the GFS model. But again, the good thing is the GFS ensembles don't support that. So you may see people talking about this, and I saw some references on Twitter, but if you take your time and you look at the reality and the ensembles, you'll see that it doesn't support it at all. Now, this is the 6 to 10 day pattern. You can see the very strong agreement here. The trough is over the eastern United States, almost on the east coast. Now, the GFS has a little more blocking in Greenland than the European does. Let me get my mark out here again. You can see it right here. A little more blocking here. The, GF, the European is more still out in the North Atlantic. So, but the flow is still strong. You can see the big height lines coming out of Canada, really pulling the Arctic air southward on all these models. So it's a cold pattern. It's a deep cold pattern. If you look at our temperature anomalies, we'll see that. In fact, it is, it is a pretty cold. There you go. There's our temperature anomalies. Look at that. 
Now, the European actually has the cold air overrunning even to, in deeper into the U.S. than the GFS. Normally, we don't see that. Normally, the GFS here is colder on the left-hand side. But as you can see, the European is colder. Now, interestingly enough, the European actually has a, a second snow threat. And not the GFS, the European. This is at day 9 for November uh, 12th. And then this is the evening of November 12th. You can see it's got a little bit of snow here in the Mid-Atlantic. Uh, some wraparound precipitation with the front and the big high here over Missouri, uh, bringing the cold air in. So there's the high here, and it's bringing the cold air in that way, so the precipitation changes over. I don't know if this is true or not. It might be, uh, but something to keep in mind. Let's take a look at the 11 to 15 day here. Not much has changed. Now, the polar vortex is still pretty far to the north. You can see how I drew it in here. Um, so that's pretty far to the north. On the 6 to 10 day, you can see what happens is that the polar vortex, let me point this out to you, uh, starts here and it ends up there. You see it makes it, it starts here and it trots southward. That's what drives the cold air south. And that's why you end up getting uh, such strong temperature anomalies in the 6 to 10 day. Let me go back to this. Here we go. There, so you can see that's why you get the temperature anomalies. Okay, so this is 11 to 15 day. You can see the polar vortex is far to the north over the northern Hudson's Bay or Baffin Island. But we still have a decent ridge on the west coast, a moderate trough over the eastern United States. It's still a cold pattern. It's not extremely cold, but it's a cold pattern. And this is 11 to 15 day temperature anomalies. Below normal, everybody east of the Rockies, especially north of Interstate 40 on the GFS and the European. They're simply arguing over the degree. Obviously, the GFS is a little colder. The European is a slightly warmer, but that's 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 not unsurprising 11 to 15 day. If we look at, at 360 hours, day 15 itself, the GFS ensemble is on the left. The European is on the right. The ridge is there on the west coast. We have a moderate trough here over the eastern United States, and the polar vortex is fairly far to the north, normally where it should be for this time of year. Now, notice neither one of these models is showing blocking over Greenland here. Now, there is a block over the Arctic region. We'll get to that in a second. But the, there is not a block here over Greenland. So the uh, NEO is neutral here. Now, if we look at the hemispheric shot, this is the European. Uh, the hemispherically, you can see it um, at, at uh, 360 hours, which is November 18th. Notice the, uh, um, we can see our little bit of a ridge right here. But look at this feature. See, this is a Caspian Sea ridge, which is pushing in here. So we have a polar vortex here, and the other one is this, so right here. So what's happened is the vortex is splitting, so you end up with a negative Arctic oscillation, potentially, by the middle of November. If that's true or not, we'll see. The CFS is showing that as well, actually. Um, you can <coughs> see it. Uh, the CFS is showing this um, uh, quite nicely with that same uh, ridge uh, building from the Caspian Sea. Uh, coming up into the Arctic region here and splitting the vortex into two. You have a moderately strong ridge on the west coast, a moderate trough here. You know, a pretty cold pattern, not the coldest pattern of all time. And then finally, if you take a look at the, um, uh, let me take a look at, let me clear this out, sorry. Uh, this is the CFS uh, extended, and this takes us out to the, um, November 23rd, almost Thanksgiving. And you can see that it's, it's pretty impressive here. There's your vortex. Okay, over uh, northern Hudson's Bay near Baffin Island. And again, uh, because the vortex is here, that you end up getting negative heights in Greenland, so you have a, a positive NAO. But we still have a very nice uh, ridge here on the west coast. We have, um, that should not be a trough, there should be a blocking pattern here. So that's wrong. It should be a blocking pattern, which is what we have there splitting the Arctic region. So we're getting that flow coming in from the Arctic area. And we have a nice broad trough sent to the middle portion of the country. Now, this has potential for maybe some sort of some sort of winter weather event around the 20th or 23rd of November. Uh, so, you know, in this sort of pattern, it's possible. Again, with a positive NAO, it's probably not a, a going to be East Coast storm, but it might be an Ohio Valley storm or a Midwest storm or what have you. Any event, uh, that's where our looks. That's our week in weather here. Um, it looks the cold pattern is going to continue. Uh, looks like it's going to continue for most of November, and we'll see what the rest of the winter, uh, you know, how it develops. I like having cold Novembers, um, especially if the pattern locks in place here, and you get a lot of snow covering the ground. Um, so we'll see. I'm kind of optimistic about the winter as things stand right now. This is meteorologist DT from Weather Risk. I'll talk to you soon.